Good morning and welcome. We continue with today's Chumash portion, the Friday Shishi portion of the portion of Noah. And before we go into the post flood story of Noah, I also want to make mention someone pointed out to me, and I think I should point out learning about Noah that we mentioned several times the seven. Noahide laws, what are they? Number one, in short, belief in one God, meaning do not worship idols. Two, to respect God and praise Him, specifically not to blasphemy. Three, to respect human life, not to murder. Four, to respect family life, not to engage in forbidden intimacies and relationships. Five, respecting other people's rights and property, do not steal. Six, creation of a judicial system, and that's the mitzvah to pursue justice. And seven, respect for all creatures, cruelty to animal, Aver minachai. These are in general terms the seven Noahide laws. And I would also like to point out that the United States officially honored the Lubavitcher Rebbe for fostering and promoting education and charity to return the world to the moral and ethical values in the seven Noahide laws. The Congress and the President proclaimed that the United States was founded upon the seven universal laws of Noah, and these laws have been the bedrock of society from the dawn of civilization. So the seven Noahide laws, I'm reading from this card, which has the seven Noahide laws. The seven Noahide laws are the very bedrock of society as we know it today in what is called the Judeo-Christian uh, society. It all goes back to the seven Noahide laws, which is the beginning of man civilized post flood mankind. Now, the first thing that happens after a flood is you have to say Lachayim. So today we read chapter 9, verse 18. Noah, Hayotzim and Ateva, the children, the descendants of Noah, emerging from the ark were shame, the chom, the yafas. Shame, chom, and yafas. These are the three sons of Noah. And here the Torah tells us, by the way, you need to know. In order to understand the story which unfolds, you need to know that Chum had four sons. Son number four, his name was Canaan. And he's about to take a very important part in the event which is about to unfold. And I hope that everybody is over 18 as we learn the event. The Chum who Avi Canaan, Chom is the father of Canaan, which means that Canaan was a son to Chom. What son? Son number four. Cush is son number one. Mitzrayim is son number two. Put is son number three. Canaan is son number four. Cush is Ethiopia. Mitzrayim is Egypt. Put is the Potomac River. Just kidding. Uh, and, and Canaan is. The, uh, the Canaanites, uh, Africa, and so on. Okay, verse 18. V'chom hu avi k'nan, lo mohu tzrech lo markan. Why does the Torah need to tell us that Chom is the father of Canaan? L'fi shah parsha suko ba, because the portion, this wild story, is about to unfold. B'shikru se noach, as noach, becomes intoxicated, he goes in, under the affluence of alcohol, or the influence of alcohol. Shakil bam chom, and chom did a terrible thing and disgraced himself. V'yal yodai, and through him, niskal al knan, knan was cursed. So that Noah cursed his son's chom's son. Now, what good is it going to do if we're learning that Noah is cursing Chom's son, if we don't even know that Chom, that Chom has a son. V'adayin le'kosav tell this Chom, the Torah has not yet told us who the children of Chom are. V'lo'yadan u'shiknan b'nei, we don't even know that Canaan is his son. L'figal therefore, hu'tzrach le'imarkan, that's why. In the beginning of the story in verse 18, the Bible, the Torah has to tell us, v'chom hu avi Canaan, that Chom is the father of Canaan. What's the deal? What happened here? Verse 19, the story is that Shlisha, Eleb, Noach, that these three sons of Noach, shame, 
Chom, and Yefes. These are the three sons of Noah. There was nobody else. Um, and from these three sons, Nofts are called the whole world <coughs> became populated and spread forth, and civilization emanates from the three sons of Noah. Every human being that exists today is either a son of Shem or a son of Chom or a son of Yephes. There is no other. 20. So what happened was the first thing that Noah did, first opportunity, is Vayochel Noah Isho Adoma. Noah became a earthy man, a farmer. And the first thing he planted was Vayita Korem, he planted a vineyard. Vayochel Osa Atzmechul, and he made himself profane. Shehoyele Lasek Tchilabedetia Obviously, in retrospect, Monday morning quarterbacking, he should have planted some kumquats or something. I mean, this ruined his whole day, and that's an understatement. Isha Adama, Adene Adama, master of the earth. Kameish Nomi, like husband of Nomi. So here it's husband of the earth. Where did he get seeds from? Where did he get a sapling from? So here we're told that Kishanichnas Lateva, the Medrash says, that when Noah entered the ark, he had a lot of supplies with him. Hichnis Ima, he also brought in with him Zmeres, saplings of grapevines, and fig little saplings. And the Medrash says every other plantation, whatever did not generate, regenerate on its own. So Noah had a whole division of stuff which was miraculously preserved, and he began to plant after. The flood, and the first thing he planted was a vine. And he made wine. I want to pause for a moment and point out that in Judaism and in life, the most sacred can also be the most profane. And the most profane can also be the most sacred. By way of example, what is the most sacred act in Judaism? Intimacy. The greatest mitzvah, the number one mitzvah, is be fruitful and multiply. What is the most profane act possible? Sexual perversion. Immorality. So here, on the one hand, it's called kiddushin, an act of holiness, and at the same time, a harlot is referred to as kidesha, an act of unholiness. Holiness and unholiness both involve the same act. Similarly speaking, there's nothing holy in Judaism that can take effect without wine. You want to bring Shabbos in? You need to make Kiddush with wine. You want to say goodbye to Shabbos? You need to make Havdola. You have a bris? You need wine. You have a pigeon aben, the redemption of the firstborn? You need wine. You have a wedding, you need wine. You want to say grace after meals, you need wine. Where don't we need wine? Wine is sacramental. By the same token, the greatest tragedies in this world come from drug and alcohol abuse. The abuse of alcohol is a terrible thing. So that the holiest thing in the world, wine, could be abused. And that's God's creation. We need to be able to choose between the sacred and the profane. It's a half a problem when you're choosing between the sacred and the mundane. That's what we call in Kabbalah and Hasidis, in that vernacular. Klipas Noga, the power of energy of this world. That's the mundane. But we have to choose very often between the sacred and the profane. And therefore we learn the tragic story of Noah and the vineyard, Noah and the wine. 21, Vayesht Minayayin, he drank of the wine, Vayishkar, and he became drunk. Vayiskal Beseich Oholoi, and in his drunken stupor, he became immodestly uncovered within his tent, and he was laying there in a very immodest manner. Rashi Vayiska, Loshin Vayispoel, this is a Hispoel grammar conjugation. Oh, Haloi, Oh, 
the word is written ohalo, although it's written ohaloi remez, this is an allusion to the ten tribes, shenikru, who were called Hashem Shemer, and by the name of Samaria, shenikru, who are called ohalo, shegolo aliskayayin, the ten tribes. You know, the lost ten tribes, they were also exiled because they drank too much. Drinking too much is a terrible, terrible thing. Drinking too little is worse. Shenemar, as it says, Hashesim b'mizrike yoyin, those who drink wine in bowls, they didn't drink wine in goblets. They drank wine in bowls. You drink too much, you got tsuris with a capital T. There is a balaturim here. And the balaturim says that vayisgal in 21, the word vayisgal has the letters of Goliath, of exile, Goliath, that they were exiled through wine. Hayayin, wine, has the numerical value of yelola, a piercing cry, a moan, a groan. So that too much wine brings troubles. What troubles did it bring here? 22. Vayar chom avi knan. Chom, father of knan, saw. Commentaries tell us, how did he see? Rashi brings down from the Medrash. He saw because his son knan told him. His son knan told him, look what grandpa, look what Zadie's doing. <laughs> He's naked. He's drunk as a skunk. Isn't that funny? So Canaan went to see as Erebas Aviv the nakedness of his father. By Yagid the Bachutz, and he went and told Chom went and told his two brothers, Shame and Yepes. Rashi Vayar Chom Avi Canaan Yesh made Abbe say no Omrim. Some of our sages say Canaan Ra that Canaan saw the Higidli Aviv and told his father. That's why he's in the equation here. Lakachuskar al Adover. That's why he was. Mentioned here, Veniskalel and was disgraced. As it says, Vayar es ervas of, Vayar es ervas of. What did he do? What's the big sin here? He saw the nakedness of his father, says the Gemara in Sanhedrin, page 70. That ain't half of it. He did a lot more than that. Yesh Emrim, there's two opinions. One opinion is, Sersei. That he castrated him. And that can ruin your whole day. And then some. The Yesh Amrim and others say, as the commentaries on Rashi say, not only did he castrate him, but first he sodomized him. Revoy, first he committed sodomy with him. Or in plain English, first he raped him. And then he sodomized him. Now that's pretty serious. I mean, this man needs counseling. Ain't no doubt about that. Which is, now, what's the background? As we're going to learn soon, but we'll jump to it, the background is a very simple background. Chom was upset. Why was Chom upset? Because he heard Noah and Mrs. Noah having conversation. What was the conversation? So what do you think? We should have more children, huh? He says, more children? That could threaten my inheritance. He says, you know, back then when Cain and Abel, there were just two of them, and they couldn't get along. How do you divide a big, big world by two? So Cain killed Abel, and then there was one. <coughs> Here there's three of us, and our Michigan, the father, wants to have more children. I mean, he's going to dilute the, the, the wealth. No good. So he decided right then and there that he's going to introduce some form of birth control. The pills didn't work, so he used castration. So that's the background. Therefore, when Noah came to, Noah said, ha, ha, ha. you miserable creature, Chom, you were concerned that I'm going to have a fourth son? Cursed be your fourth son. Chom, uh, Aknan is number four. And from that moment and on, the Canaanite nations were cursed. Cursed to do what? Cursed to be slaves as we're about to learn. Why was he cursed? Because he's the one that ran and told his, his father, look what Zadie's doing. That's some background. 23, Vayikach, Shem, and Yepes. And Shem and Yepes took 
They took a blanket, a garment, and they placed it on their shoulders. And they entered into the room, face away from their father, not seeing him backwards. And they covered the nakedness of their father. But their face was turned around. And they did not see the exposed nakedness of their father. They acted in the most modest manner. It doesn't say they took Elavayikach, he took Lima. This teaches us Al Shem, that Shem was more into this mitzvah. He was more eager. That's why the merit of Shem's descendants are that we have the garment, the talus. To this day, what happens? A Jew comes into a shul, puts on a talus. A Jew goes wherever he goes, he wears a talit katan, a mini talus under his shirt. But Yefes and Yefes Zocha, he merited Likvuda Labanov. In the war, he merited to be able to bury his children instead of them laying exposed. Shanam, as it says, Eten Legeg, Mekem Shom Kever, in the war of Golgan Mogag, which is a war predicted to occur before Mashiach comes, and Yefes's children take a serious part in that war. I'll allow them a place of burial. The Chom Shebizas of it, but Chom who degraded and insulted his father, Nemar Bezara, it says the opposite. Cain Yinag Melech Asher, the king of Assyria, would drive and lead away Ashvi Mitzrayim, the captives of Egypt. Egypt is Chom. Egypt is, remember, Chom had four sons. Cush, Ethiopia. Mitzrayim, Egypt. Put and Canaan. There's Golas Cush and the exiles of the Ethiopians, Neorim Muskinim, young and old. Orim V'yochev, naked and barefoot. Vachasufeshesh with uncovered buttocks. That's how they were led into exile. Ufneim achiran, as their faces were turned around. Why does it say again? Melamik Shkar Wetzlay, this teaches us that when they came close, they had to turn themselves to cover. Hafchupneim achiran, as they had to turn their body to the front, their faces turned to the back. I know it's late, but I must share a very important teaching of the Baal Shem Tov on this verse. The Baal Shem Tov teaches us something fantastic. The Baal Shem Tov says, why is it that Chom saw, Chom saw that his father was naked? Shem and Yafas didn't see. What, were they blind? The answer is that when we see something which is a negative in someone else and we're bothered by it, it means that there's something incomplete within us. Because if we weren't incomplete in our own life, someone else's negative trait would not upset us. We would just say, hey, I'm here to help. And you would reach out to them. The fact that you can't just reach out with a smile and with love, but you have to get upset about it, means there's something lacking in you. That's why Shem didn't see. Shem was not bothered by it. A tzaddik sees that somebody is missing a mitzvah. He walks over to him. He says, good morning. How are you? Let's do a mitzvah together. A person who lacks sees that someone is missing a mitzvah, he badmouths them. Look at this guy, he's disgusting, he doesn't even do that mitzvah. So who gains from that? So that when you're bothered by it, it means there's something wrong with you. And that's the chum syndrome. The chum syndrome is that all you can do is get upset about someone else having negative traits. The shem syndrome is you walk around, you embrace, you smile, and you lead people to kindness and goodness and to mitzvahs and to good deeds. It doesn't bother you because you're not offended by it. It just hurts you that someone is missing a great opportunity of connecting to God. That's, in short, this very critical teaching of the Baal Shem Tov. When somebody is bugging you, ask yourself, why are you so bothered by it? If it's the right and the wrong, there's a lot of right and wrong in the world. Back to the text. I actually heard a beautiful interpretation yesterday. Why did Noah get drunk? Noah comes out of the ark and he gets drunk. The answer is 
Noah drank the same amount he always drank. But the world changed. Before the flood, the nature of the world was that he could handle that amount of alcohol. Now in the post-flood world, all the laws changed. So the same amount of alcohol intoxicated him. Interesting twist. 24, Vayiketz Noach Miyeno, Yo Noach came to Vayeda, and he realized they said, also they b'nei akotan, what his younger son did to him. Rashi points out, what is the lesson of b'no akotan, haposel v'abozi, his unfit son, his despised son, kimahine akotan, asatichah bagoyim, bozi bom, it means young in conduct, not necessarily chronologically young. Vayomer, and he said, these fateful words, 25, Orur Knan, <coughs> cursed be your fourth son, Knan. Eved avodim yiye le'echav, a slave to slaves, he shall be to his brothers. Knan is cursed with slavery. Orur Knan, 25, why is he cursing Knan? Atagaram tali, you have caused me. I shared this earlier, not to bring a fourth son into this world. Why do you have children? Remember I always say, why have children? To reach high places and to send them to the store. I don't have a fourth son to reach high places and to send them to the store. Or bin Choravi, your fourth son is now cursed. That he should serve the offspring of the older ones. Shoot all alayim tayr chava dosim yata because they're gonna have to pick up the slack because you didn't allow me to have more children. And here Rashi tells us what I shared earlier. Omaro chom shaser say ma pitom. Why did he have to castrate him? Amar lo hamli achav. He said to his brothers, Adam arishin shnei bonim hayuloi. Adam had two sons, Cain and Abel. Vaharag says that one killed the other. Bishvil yirushas oila because they couldn't divvy up the world. Vyavino and our father yeshle gibo bonim has three sons. Still looking for a fourth son? As they used to say in Russia, Nishbamir Mocha, no Saribab. And he had a good solution. 26, on the other hand, says Noah, he said, Baruch Hashem. This is one of the few places in the Torah where it says, Baruch Hashem. Eloke Shem, blessed be God, God of Shem. Vichnan Ebed Loma in Knan should be the servant forever. Baruch Hashem and the Keshem should also lish me after Chosu Lizare, who is destined to keep his promise to his offspring. Los Lamitzel Knan to give them Knan, vihi lahem Knan, and Knan should be Lamas Eved as a servant under task forever. What about Yefes? Shame is blessed. Chom Knan is cursed. Yafta lekim the Yefes. Let Hashem enlarge. Expand Yefes, be Yishkeim, let him dwell, be all the shame in the tents of shame, be Chnan Ebed Lama, and Chnan should be his servant. Yafta Lakim Le Yefes, Meturgam Yaf, Yarchiv, enlarge, be Yishkeim, be all the shame, Yashish Chnosim Yisro, he should cause his divine presence to dwell in Israel. The Medrash says, Apa Pishi Yafta Lakim Le Yefes, even though Hashem enlarged Yefes, Shebono Kedesh, this is Cyrus who built. Shaivim Re Yefes, he was a descendant of Yefes, by Hashem. Cyrus built the second holy temple, he was a descendant of Yefes. Yafta the Kim Liefes, he brought about expansion. The divine presence was not as great in the second base of Migdush as it was in the first. Where was the divine presence truly manifested? In the first holy temple that King Solomon built. King Solomon was from the descendants of Shem. Even when the sons of Shem will go into exile, they'll still be sold slaves from the sons of Canaan. So this is the curse of Canaan. And here the Torah concludes this particular chapter. And Noah lived after the flood. Noah had a long life after the flood. Another 350 years. He called Yemei Noach, the entire lifespan of Noach was 950 years. And he died, so Noach lived till a ripe old age and really cut into Social Security. Now we go to chapter 10, where we get into the lineage and the countries and the kingdoms and the nations who evolved from these three sons. The A let tell this Bnei Noach, and these are descendants of the sons of Noach. Which sons of Noach? Shem and Chom and Yafes. And 
children were born to them after the flood. In the flood, in the ark, there was only Shem, Chom, and Yopas and their wives. After the flood, they had lots of children. And here he goes on to enumerate them, B'nai Yephes, the sons of Yephes, Gomer. This is the famous Gomer pile. Just kidding. Mogog from the Gogu Mogog. Modai, this is Medea. Yovon, Greece. You know the people who break plates at weddings? Vesuvo, Umeshech, Vesiros. These are some of the Bnei Gomer. Vesiros is Poras, Persia. Three of Bnei Gomer and the sons of Gomer, Ashkenaz. Ashkenaz is usually the Hebrew word for Germany. Verifas Vesegarma. Now, it, it must be said that it, it says that Nebuchadnezzar came and other great... Uh, Kings came and brought about forced population exchanges. So today we really don't know who's who. Uvenei Yovon and the sons of Yovon, Elisha and Tarshish, Kitim Videidonim, Me'ele, from these, Nifridu Ihaigoyim, were divided the islands of the nations, Be'atseisam, in their lands, Ishlo Shaina, each to his language, the Mishpachesam, by their families, Bigoyeim, by their Countries of Necham, mentioned earlier, the sons of Cham were four. Kush, which is translated as Ethiopia, Mitzrayim, Egypt. And it's interesting, interesting that the Egypt, the biblical Egypt, was an African country, not an Arab country. It's a descendant of Cham. The Arab nations are descendant of Shem. Ufut, and Canaan. Seven of Kush and the sons of Kush, Svo, Bachabila Besapta, Verama Besapta, of Nerama, Shvo, Udidon. Eight, the Kush, Yolo, then Kush gave birth, Kush fathered Nimrod. That's Nimrod. Nimrod was the king of the superpower during the time of Abraham. Nimrod is the one who threw Abraham into the furnace because he refused to worship idols or because he broke his father's idols. This was Nimrod the tyrant. He became a strong man and he was a totalitarian dictator. He did what he wanted to, when he wanted to, how he wanted to. Nine, who haya gibor tzayid lifnei Hashem. He was a starker, a mighty hunter before Hashem. Al Kain Yomar, therefore it is said, Kin Nimrod, like Nimrod, Gibor Tsayid, a mighty hunter, Lefne Hashem before Hashem. Nine, Gibor Tsayid, saw Daiton, he captures the minds, Shabrias of people, befeeb with his mouth. He was a liar. Or, in modern terminology, he was a diplomat. Umaton limroid bamokim, and he leads people astray to rebel against God because Nimrod was an atheist. Nimrod's platform was anti God. He did everything he could to anger God, to be against God. Al Cain, ye Omer, and therefore people would say, Ki Nimrod gibor tzayid lefnei Hashem like Nimrod, a mighty hunter before Hashem. Rashi, I'll kain your Omer, I'll call Adam. Mashia bazos ponim. Therefore, it became acceptable for society to declare that anyone who acts with insolence, with chutzpah, he's he's described as yodea ribono. He knows his maker. O miskaven Nimrod by and intends to rebel. Nimrod is not someone who didn't know God. Nimrod is someone who hated God. Ye Omar Zek Nibur Gibber Tsayid, like Nimrod, who is a mighty hunter. There's the, the wonderful story I like to tell of the man who came to a town in Eastern Europe and he introduced himself as an Apicorus, as a heretic. Anyway, the rabbi heard about it. He invited him to come and have breakfast with him. The rabbi said, Quite frankly, I've never had the privilege to sit face to face with a with a real Apicorus, a real heretic. Let's discuss uh, Maimonides, Nachmanides, the Talmud, the Mishnah, philosophy, theories. And he says, Rabbi, you don't understand. I'm an uh, Apikoros. I don't study Maimonides. I don't study Nachmanides. I don't study. 
and on and on and on to cut to the chase. He says, okay, let's talk about Mishnah. Let's talk about Rashi. Let's talk about Chumash. He says, one final time, I'm an Apikoros. I don't do this stuff. He says, forgive me. No disrespect meant. You're not an Apikoros. You're not a heretic. You're an ignoramus. In order to be an Apikoros, you have to be a scholar. Nimrod was an Apikoros. He was a scholar. He knew God and rebelled against him. Most other people, they don't know God. If you're not a Torah scholar, you can't be an Apikoros. Ten, Vatihi, Reishis, Mamlachte, the beginning of his kingdom was Bovel, Babylon, the Ered, the Akkad, the Chalne, all be at a Shinor in Babylon. Minoret Sahi, from that country, Yotso, they went to Ashur, Assyria, the Assyria kingdom. By even, and they built us Ninveh, Vesrechevis Ir. Ninveh is the city that the Jonah and the whale story involves, near Babylon, Veskolach. Rashi mino oretz kibin shero Asher was born of when Asher saw his sons shaman hearkening le Nimrod umerdim b'makim livnis on Migdol and they began to build the famous Tower of Babel. So Asher said, "Heck no, yotzam itaycham." He left. Twelve yes resen and resen be Ninveh ben Kolach between Ninveh and Kolach. He oiragdeila. That's the big city. Oiragdeila in Ninveh. That's Ninveh shenemar, as it says in the Jonah and the whale story. Ninveh was a great city. 13. These are the sons of Mitzrayim. 13. Their faces were inflamed. They were red. 14. And the Pasrusim and Kasluchim, who were the forerunners of the Philistines. Yes, Kaptaidim and the Kaptaidim, Pasrusim, Yes, Kasluchim, Asher Yotzu Mishom, Plishtim, Mishneim Yotzu. The Philistines came forth from both of them because there was a lot of hanky panky going on. Shoyo Pasrusim, Bikasluchim, Machlifim, Mishka, Vishesayim. There was a process known as wife swapping that went on. Eilu lo Eilu, one to another, the Yotzu Mehem, Plishtim, and the Philistines issued from this big Mishmash. Fifth, so this is all the product of Chom. Fifteen. O oh, Knan, what about Knan? Yolad, he begot, he gave birth to a Sidon, Bechor, Sidon, his firstborn, Ves Ches, and Ches. When Abraham bought the cave of Machpelah in Hebron from Bnei Ches, this, these are Canaanites. By the way, it's Chase. It's not Chase. Chase is in Manhattan. Chase is in Canaanites. 16, Ves HaYevusi. And here are the Canaanite nations. The Yevusi, Ves HaAmori, Ves HaGirgoshi, Ves HaChivi, Ves HaArki, Ves HaSini, Ves HaArvodi, Ves HaTzmori, Ves HaChamosi, Ve Achan HaFeitzu Mishpchei Saknani. The area around Tzfas is also called Hamas. Knan. 18. From these came many families. 19. The Canaanite boundary was Mitzidain from Sidon, Lebanon. To Gror, Ad Aza, Gaza. Into Sodom and Gomorrah. These are the five Sodomite cities of Sodom and Gomorrah along what is the Dead Sea. Rashi 19, Gvul Knani, Seif Arce, the end of his country. Called Gvul Asher Seif Akotz, it means the end. Bayach Hashem Dover, Belini Rekhadam Ayim Machaber, Gvul Zamagiyad Shad Tovei, the Gvul Plani, the boundary goes until you come to this and this boundary. Eileb and Echom, these are the descendants of Chom, the Chom, by their families. Lil Shonesim, by their languages, Biatseisim, their lands, Bigayayim, by their nations. Rashi, Lil Shonesim, Biatseisim, 20, Af Bishanech, Kulu Shonesim, Atzus. Even though they evolved into many languages and many countries, they're all descendants of Chum. And finally, 21, Ula Shem, Yulad Gamhu, Shem also fathered Avi Kobne Ever, the father of all of the people of Ever. You know, we always talk about the yeshiva of Shem and Ever. Ever was a grandson of Shem, actually, a great grandson, if you want to get technical. Achi Yefes Hagodol, the older brother of Yefes. Rashi, Avi, called Bnei Ever, Hanor, Hoyosham. The reason he's called Ever is because it's across the river. 
Achi yepsagod leinidim yepsagod l'shem. I'm not sure who's older, yepes or shem. Shuem shem be mashona. Shnasayim achram abel abayim yepes gadol. When it says shem was a hundred years old, two years after the flood, I say yepes is older. Shari ben top kup shona. Hayo noach shi yischol hayo. Because noach was five hundred when he started having children. Amabel hayo b'shnas sheish me shona, and the flood occurred in the six hundredth year. Nim se shagod l'bavana hayo ben me shona. The oldest was a hundred. Shem leigil le meach nasayim. And Shem didn't get to 100 until two years later. Shem and Yepes honored their father. Chom abused their father. That's what we call, in today's terminology, elder abuse. Chom was guilty of elder abuse, which I must tell you, my friends, is a serious problem in today's world. Elder abuse. Chom was the first biblically documented elder abuser. So that Abishter up it may Hashem protect. Okay. Twenty two B'nai Shame, the sons of Shame, were Elam, Ashur, Arpachshad, Velud, Va'arom. And the sons of Arom were Utz Vechu, Vegesir Vamash. And here we're interested in shame leading down to Abraham. Var Pachshad Yolad as Sholach and Shalach Yolad as Aver. So here you have Aver, the great grandson of Shame. Well, the Aver, you like Shnei Bonim. Aver had two sons. Shem had Peleg. One was Peleg, the one we're interested in. Ki biyom of Nif the Gaharas, because in his days the earth was divided. This was the days of the Tower of Babel when many languages came about and humanity was dispersed all over the world, or all over that world at least. Shem Ochiv Yokton, and his little brother's name was Daryl. No, not Daryl, it was Yokton. Niflagon is Babylon, Al Shain is the languages were confused when Afaitsu and they spread forth. Minabika from the plains, the fruited plains. Minispalgu Bachalo Elam, they were separated throughout the world. Lamadnu, from here we learn, Shaya Ava Nobi that Ava was a prophet, because he prophetically named his son, Shakara Shem Bnei Al Shem Os, and he named his son Peleg for the futuristic division of society, of civilization. And we learned in the order of history, that this happened at the end of Peleg's days. If you say that in the beginning, brother Yachton is, young, is younger. And he had many families before that. And afterwards it says, if you say it was in the middle of Peleg's time, that's not the way the verse works. That only in the year that Peleg died, did the Der HaFloga story take place? Therefore, his father, Aver, was a prophet, and Aver was a tzaddik, and Aver was a prophet, and so on. Twenty, what, what are we up to now? Twenty-seven. Yes, Hadedam, Ves Uzal, Ves Dikla, Ves Evel, Ves Avimo, Ves Shva, Ves Efer, Ves Chavil, Ves Jevav. All of these are Bnei Yokton, who don't interest us. Rashi Yokton. Shoya Onav Yokton was humble. Umaktanatz may he made himself small. Lakach zochel amen kol mishpach solo. That's why he had so many children. Chatzar mobes Hashem became it. That's a place. Divin Agad as the Metrus says. By he may shavam and their dwelling war by Achas Mesha from a place called Mesha by Achaswara Har Hakedem to the mountain of Kedem Ela bnei Shem lemishpachisam. These are the children of Shem by their families. Loshanaisam by their languages. Baratzaisam by their lands. Legayehem. By their nations, and Ela, the above are Mishpachis, the families, Bnei Noach of the sons of Noach, the Begayim for their nations, who may Ela, and from all of these, Nifredu Hagayim, all the nations were divided, Ba'aretz on earth, Acharamabel after the flood, end of today's Chumash portion.